Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome. Today, I have actor and screenwriter David Hader on. Uh, David, thank you so much for doing this. Well, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Yeah. So uh, just to start things off, I was wondering, what got you into screenwriting and acting? Um, well, my mother got me into acting. Uh, she used to do community theater and she talked me into auditioning for a play when I was nine. And I did that and somebody asked me for my autograph afterwards and I thought, this is pretty good. And and so I, uh, uh, that's how that started. And then uh, when Raiders of the Lost Ark came out, I started writing uh, a mashup of Raiders and Star Wars fan fiction uh, before that was a thing. And, and um, I got pretty obsessive about that. So those were the, those are the seeds of how it happened. And then, uh, you know, I moved to Hollywood when I was 20 to make my way and, and uh, business took me in all sorts of different directions. And here we are. Yeah, that's amazing. So um, I was always wondering how many pages was the uh, Metal Gear Solid scripts and how many more pages were there in the sequel scripts? Because th those are very dense, dense uh, games. Um, I'm not, I don't know how many pages were in the first game. I mean, it was a stack. I can't even fit it in the, uh, in the zoom thing. It was probably, probably a thousand pages or so. Uh, it, it only took us 10 days to record, but to give you an idea, Metal Gear 4 took us nine months. So that's how much longer the scripts got I, you know it would have been just boxes upon boxes of of script pages uh but we you know we never got them all at once so but i bet you they were nearly as tall as i am <laughs> by the end yeah yeah uh so most people associate you with south snake but many may be surprised to know you're a screenwriter what was the process <laughs> and experience like for uh writing your movies um well every movie is different uh you know i've written some expensive movies so that's always stressful there's always a lot of pressure from the studios from the filmmakers um but in the end you know to be able to write dialogue for patrick stewart and ian mckellen or or hugh jackman or halle berry uh is a pretty amazing thing you know you you sit with the director and you work out scenes and and then you know this this army of craftspeople come in and build incredible sets and these incredible actors come in and bring it all to life and it's just magical i mean it's it's uh it's sort of the culmination of everything i wanted to do in my life and and it's pretty cool to to see it happen yeah with x-men how did you manage to like balance so many characters and not lose sort of like the emotional core of the story well, I did something very specific. I, uh, you know, we had eleven main characters um, in in X Men, and that was a big concern for the studio. They were like, you know, we hadn't seen anything like Avengers or anything like that yet. So, um, what I did was I did a search for each character's name in the dialogue. So, um, I'd go, I'd search Cyclops' uh, character name, and I'd just go through all of his dialogue and say, okay where does he start in the movie emotionally you know what are the turning points where does he end up and i tried to make sure that everybody had uh, a journey um even if it's simple even if it's just three beats uh, throughout um the audience will will feel that and so um uh, so that's how i did it and you, you know and there were a few characters where it was like oh they basically just say stuff and nothing really changes so you know you make subtle tweaks to it and and hopefully Everybody feels like uh, a, f a fully fleshed out character. Yeah. With uh, Watchmen, how did you manage to faithfully adapt the material and then like decide what to leave out and what to put in and kind of make it work as a movie? Well, with Watchmen, you know, my opinion was that the the book uh, by Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons is is one of the greatest novels of all time, one of the best written books of all time. Uh, and so really, it was just a matter of making sure that I, tr I, I wrote a draft. Um, the big controversy was we, we took out the, the, the giant squid at the end. 
and that was because of 9-11, that was because of uh, the amount of exposition it would have taken to to explain how the squid worked and you know it would have been made the movie a half an hour longer which which we couldn't really afford because it was already three hours long um beyond that so you know that had to change and we we had to simplify that unfortunately but beyond that my goal was to leave in every badass line every amazing idea every amazing um sequence in in that book and we pretty much did that you know we uh you know, we even we intended to to make the Tales from the Black Freighter uh, comic book portion of the movie. We intended to make that animated from the beginning. Um, so so really the goal was to keep, uh, you know, I'll say 90 to 95 percent of what the original book was in the movie. That was the point of making the movie. Yeah. I mean, it was, that, that was the great thing is that it didn't seem like it took away. Like the only thing it changed was the squid, which I thought made sense because if you just. Well, we found a, we found a solution that was already woven into the thing. It was yeah. suggested by a friend of Darren Aronofsky's um, physics professor uh, who suggested the, the idea of what we went with in the end. And I thought that makes sense. And it's, it's simpler. It's woven into the story. Yeah, um, I'm not going to say it's better. Nothing is better than Alan Moore, uh, but um, but it worked. And so, uh, but beyond that, you know, I wanted I wanted every every amazing moment in that book to be in the movie, and we very nearly accomplished that. Yeah. Um, so, Metal Gear Solid Two: Sons of Liberty. That game was really ahead of its time. You know, when they're talking about how AI can basically control free will and stuff like that mm -hmm. and now with current events we can see that wow there's actually a lot going on with ai that you know we we wouldn't have predicted a while ago that we would have said oh well that's only in the movies right you know and what was your reaction to that game story and like has has like your sort of point of view changed on it or like what did you think of it well, you know, obviously it's very strange and it's and it's intentionally strange. It's it's presenting a world that where you can't really trust what's going on because you never know what's AI and, and what isn't. Um and there's weird thing, you know, you 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 end up, you know, if you're playing Raiden and you end up naked in the quote unquote bowels of Arsenal gear, the rectum of <laughs> Arsenal gear or whatever. Yeah. And the colonel's going nuts and he's talking about the flap turtle uh, space jam. He needs scissors sixty one. You know, it all, uh, it's all pretty insane, but at the same time, you know, Hideo Kojima does not put anything into his games that is not researched. And, um, you know, that's, I think that's part of his, his, his brilliance in, in knowing what's coming in the future and applying that to games you know, 10, 20 years in advance of, of where it's going to be. So, um, so I didn't, I, I never really doubted that his take on AI was correct. Um, I thought it was pretty chilling. Uh, and I think it's chilling to this day. Um, but it's just so fun because it's wrapped up in all this weirdness and, and he's sort of making a point, you know, it's sort of like a Terry Gilliam point of, of how insane the world's going to get when AI becomes its own force you know yeah so. and then it also deals with nuclear deterrence especially like during the third game of the uh you know in the wake of the cold war uh it, like how, how do those games stay so topical for so many years like because you could just like play into today and you're like oh wow Metal Gear Solid 3 that reminds me of what's going on today with Putin or Metal Gear Solid 2 there's what's going on with AI it's like it, it somehow it always like just stays in your mind and you know stays well, relevant well again you know Kojima knows what's coming. He's 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 very informed about the subjects that he uh, that he takes on. So, you know, you look at uh, Metal Gear Four. It's all about privatized military companies, yeah. which you know, and which had started to exist. You know, BlackRock and and whatnot existed at, at that point. So you could see those things coming. But now, look, a privatized military company just marched on Moscow, like. Mm the other day so yeah. <laughs> you know these so when you when you're able to accurately look 10 or 20 years into the future and it can be done if you're if you're well informed or you're willing to study your games will stay relevant and um 
you know, look at, I mean, Metal Gear Solid came out in 1998 and it was all about mapping the human genome. It was all about, you know, DNA manipulation, all these things, you know, that's just where Kojima knew we were going uh, scientifically and, and as a, as a culture. Yeah. So what's the difference between a video game script and uh, like writing a screenplay or a television show? Because I, I remember when I was taking like screenwriting classes in LA years and years and years ago, like someone came in and they said, don't ever write a video game script. It's the worst thing you could ever do. <laughs> Why? What, yeah. What's, what's the thinking behind that? I don't know. But like, I remember that and like someone wrote an article about like why you shouldn't write one. Like what, what is the difference between like a game script and like a screenplay? Uh, you know, that's a complex question. Um, the, you know, the basic storytelling is the same. You know, you want good dialogue, you want high stakes, you want interesting characters. Um, storytelling is just storytelling. But um, but there's a few things that make games different uh, from movies. First of all, in a movie, um, your lead character can die. Uh, you know, if you look at, I mean, uh, spoilers for Psycho, you know, your lead character dies 45 minutes into the movie and um, and becomes a different thing. And it's difficult to do that in a game because you are the character. So you, you kind of know your character's not, or your character might die, but it's just going to come back in two seconds and, and you'll continue the story. So, um, so that makes the stakes harder to set up for, for video games. Also, um, you know, a movie, a movie, even if it's a huge epic, is essentially a short story. It's a story you can tell in two hours, three hours, uh, if it's an epic. And a video game, you know, you might be playing for, you know, Red Dead Redemption, you might be playing for 100 hours with these people. So, so it's more episodic storytelling. It's more a matter of we're going to go in on this certain mission, try to invest the audience in the stakes of this particular thing. And then once we solve that, we'll go on to something else. Whereas if you did that in a movie, it would just feel fractured and like, where's the story going? There's no, there's no through line. Um, and then there's also branching dialogue. There's, uh, you know, in video games, there's branching character development. You can go, you know, in Star Wars, The Old Republic, uh, which I'm in, you, you, you can go light side Jedi, you can go dark side Jedi. This affects your, your, your experience. And, and it's more of a choose your own adventure sort of uh, format. So, so there's a lot of differences, uh, you know, technical and creative differences between video game uh, scripts and movie scripts. But at the same time, if they're done well, they can be a masterpiece. Like I would say uh, Grand Theft Auto V is just feels like a movie that you're living and all of those characters are so well fleshed out and the relationships between them are so compelling. So, you know, anybody who tells you that you shouldn't write video game scripts just doesn't know how to write a good video game script mm, that's that's a good point as a storytelling format how do you think video games changed since uh, metal gear solid well i'm biased but i would say video games changed because of metal gear solid and and yeah. i think that kojima opened the door to say a video game not all video games but 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 like a a, a a truly memorable video game experience is one where you feel like you're living in a movie. Um, so games have gotten so much more cinematic. The stories have gotten so much better. The acting has gotten so much better. Um, and, uh, and the worlds are obviously so expansive and, and huge. Um, and I think, you know, I think a lot of that is owed, uh, owed to, to Metal Gear Solid. Um, and I, as a video game fan, I'm, I'm here for it. I, there's nothing more that I love than disappearing into Red Dead Redemption or Grand Theft Auto or whatever and just living in that world. So um uh so yeah, it's it's gotten it's gotten pretty good. Yeah. So who were your influences growing up? Uh which actors do you look up to now? Well, I was very influenced by Harrison Ford. Um, you know, had a huge impact on me, it made me start talking cooler when I was uh <laughs> 12 years old you know people have, people would be like hey dave you want to hang out and i'd be like sure kid you know <laughs> why not and uh so uh tom cruise um when 
when Top Gun came out, I was living in Japan. I was 16 years old and we had very few Western movies. So I saw Top Gun in the theater. I don't know how many times. And, and I developed, you know, all of, all of my facial expressions and little things that I do spinning my pen or whatever. It all comes from Tom Cruise and in, in that uh, movie. Um, but I mean, I've got a million, I mean, like I love Jeremy Irons. I love Anthony Hopkins. Uh, you know, just so many, so many actors um, inspired me and, and were an influence on me. So which movie was the most challenging one for you to write? What's the most challenging for me to write? Well, I guess the first X-Men was the most challenging because it was my first writing job. Um, the studio didn't want me there. Uh, actors didn't know who I was. Nobody knew who I was. And, and um, so I had to fight a lot of uh, mistrust and, and a lot of... Um, harsh uh judgment and pressure um but at the same time i also knew it was my big break so i, I was very inspired to uh, you know i i just decided whatever hassles i'm getting or whatever abuse i might take to just keep my head down focus on making the movie as good as it could possibly be and, and things would work out um uh and they did and and so uh so that was probably the most difficult experience, but um, but it was pretty pretty badass in the end. So I always wonder, does doing Snake's voice, has it ever strained your voice at all? I know like Andy Serkis talked way back about how he would drink like a certain sort of honey drink that would keep his throat from basically getting completely screwed up. Uh, yeah um no uh no the snake voice i can do all day and i do i do it you know if i go to, when i'm at the chicago uh comic-con i'll be doing it all day for every single person so i i i found a way to do it that doesn't hurt my voice um you know old snake when he's really falling apart towards the end is is a little more difficult but i can do it without damage uh but the one that kills me is um, I do King Shark on the Flash TV show. And that's like, where's the Flash? And, and if I do that for 25 minutes, which is an average sort of session on that character, uh, I lose my voice for like three days. So as a voice actor, you shouldn't really try to do voices that damage your vocal cords. Um, but I wanted to play a giant shark so bad. I was like, well, we'll just suck it up. Uh, yep. but for for the most part no i you know snake sounds like it's hard on the voice but but it's actually it's it's second nature now yeah it sounds like it takes a, just like a little bit of practice and then that's all you need <laughs> yeah yeah it, it is it's like a singing technique it's like it's the voiceover technique and and so it's good to have i had a lot of theater training so i've got a lot of control of my voice and and uh so that all of that is important to people yeah. contemplating a career doing this yeah. do you have like a favorite metal gear solid game and if so uh, which one would it be and why you know it's 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 hard to say because they're they're all so good they're all so good and they're all so unique to themselves um so i have love for all of them uh i like to say that snake eater is my favorite in that i think I mean, I love the world. I love the jungle. I love the retro feel of it. Uh, I love the story, the characters. It feels like sort of the most perfect, you know, living a movie experience of all the games. But, you know, you could sort of, you could say the same thing about, about Metal Gear Solid, about the first one. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a world that you step into and you live, you meet all these incredible characters. Um, so I hate to reduce it to just one, but 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 Snake Eater is something really special, and and uh, uh, it's yeah. it's probably my favorite one to go back and replay. Yeah, and now and now it's they're coming out with the new one. <laughs> I'm so excited! It's gonna yeah, be beautiful oh. and spectacular. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, it's not a pinchinko machine or something like that. Let's <laughs> hope. Yeah. Let's hope. <laughs> right. Uh, so. Why do you think uh, Solid Snake aims to help humanity when time and time again he's been betrayed by people who's supposed to aid him? That, that my friend, is the key to Solid Snake. You know, he, he 
sounds like such a badass and he is a badass he can you know fight off giant nuclear walking battle tanks but he cannot step away from somebody who's in pain or needs his help uh he just can't do it he's just he's so he's got such a soft heart um and i think that that is the key to what makes him so lovable um you know there's something so sympathetic i think to um a soldier uh, and i would say this happens a lot throughout history a soldier who gets sent into a horrible situation by people who aren't being honest with them who have their own private agendas who who are letting young people die for money for power for whatever and the idea of a soldier who's who's been dealt all of these these horrible cards again and again but can't but but never gets never loses his heart never loses his compassion for other people is <clears throat> is a really admirable um type of character and and I think that that's what that's what makes him lovable and that's what makes me love playing him it's not just you know like I say like King Shark is just like where's the flash and I'm gonna kill the flash he's got you know he's pretty simple and straightforward and that's fun in its own way <laughs> But Snake, you know, the fact that he's hassling little Sunny over her horrible fried eggs, but if she was in trouble, he would, you know, put his life on the line to save her. It's, that's what makes Snake yeah. what he is, you know? Yeah. And how do you think Big Boss, how do you think his life could have been different if he wasn't used by everyone? Is he weaker willed and empathy than his son, you think? You know, that's an amazing question. Uh, I've never been asked. And as you were saying it, before you said it, I thought the same thing. Yeah, I think so. I think the difference between Big Boss and Solid Snake is that Big Boss lets it all get to him and lets himself become the bad guy, um, or at least a morally, uh, you know, questionable guy, um, because he's been treated poorly. And, uh, and the amazing journey of solid snake is that he does not allow that to happen even though he's just a direct clone of this this man for some reason something beyond his dna makes solid snake continue to care uh when lesser men would uh would turn their hearts to stone so uh yeah that's a really that's a really interesting uh take on it yeah well it always seemed like they both kind of get used by people except one of them let it get to him while the other one still believes in the best of people and that's kind of why i always like solid snake yeah it's and, almost like solid snake it, it it's like you know big boss gets gets abused or lied to or whatever and he lets it make him bitter and makes him say okay i'm going to take over i'm going to create my own world and that's how i'm going to deal with it and with solid snake it's almost like the more abuse he takes the more he commits himself to doing the right thing. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's that's really cool. Yeah. Do you think, have you ever been able to make sense of Metal Gear's story? Because it gets uh, confusing to say the least. <laughs> yeah, um, not really. I mean, in some ways, uh, you know, I understand, I understand it you know, as well as most people, I think, but I, but also I think the point is you can't understand it all. I think some of it's so, so strange and so ambiguous. Um, uh, and that's done intentionally so that you, so that you always feel like there's more to this world than you could possibly grasp. And that's a difficult trick to, to pull off writing wise. So, um, so, you know, I, I basically get it, but, but always while we're doing the game, I'm, I'm asking Chris Zimmerman, the, our voice director, like, okay, who is this guy? How do I know this person? Why am I hanging out with this little kid on a, on a plane? Like, you know, uh, and they have to find out. And sometimes they, even they don't know, you know, you, you'd have to go to Kojima <laughs> to get the answer. And that's not always an option. So, uh, so no, I don't understand it all, but I understand a good amount of it. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so what's the greatest lesson you think you learned from working in Hollywood? <laughs> Don't trust people in Hollywood. Uh, no, that's not true. Um, I mean, it's, it's mostly a little, true. It's a little true. <laughs> it's a little true. Um, there's a lot of nice people in Hollywood. There's a lot of pros, but, you know, there's a lot of scumbags and a lot of lying as well. 
Um, what's the most important lesson? I, you know, I think the most important lesson is don't take it all too seriously. Don't let the failures crush you. Don't let the the um, the evil of others destroy your love of creativity. Um, just you know, follow your heart, follow your passion and fire uh, wherever it takes you, and um, and don't you know, don't don't take it all too seriously. I think is what I would say. Mm. Um, so what's the recording sessions like? Do you guys voice together or, or are you separate and, you know, like people come in different days and just edit the uh, voices together? Depends on the game. Uh, so again, Star Wars, The Old Republic, we just come in one by one and we do, and none of the lines are, are in chronological order. It's like you have random lines, light side responses, neutral responses, dark side responses, and you have to make it sound like a full conversation and that's its own trick. Um, but on Metal Gear, when we did Metal Gear Solid, we happened to record in this living room with like five different mics. And so all the actors would act together and it made the scenes just come alive and be amazing. Um, so whenever we would do another Metal Gear, I would insist in my contract that we record with the actors together. And so, so every single one of those games, we had a bunch of chairs set up. And I would just sit for months and the greatest voice actors in the world would come in and we'd do scenes together. And it was amazing. It was so uh, much better for um, for the scenes, for the games. Uh, so that was really a, a cool thing. So was, so when you get to work together with everybody, it's it's better, but that's not always um, possible. Right. And then I'll just leave you with one more question because uh, we only have like two minutes left. Um, how did you get cast as Solid Snake? Um, uh, well, the story is, I'm not entirely certain of what's true and what's not, but the story is that Chris Zimmerman, who had been the casting director on Captain Planet, which was my first voiceover job, was casting the role, and my very dear friend Jennifer Hale, the legendary voice actress uh, from uh, Mass Effect and a million other things, um, suggested my name and Chris remembered me and said, oh yeah, David, okay, we'll bring him in. Uh, and I just went in and I auditioned and then I got the part. And uh, so I really owe it all to Jennifer and to Chris and, uh, you know, changed, changed my whole life. David, thank you so much for doing it. This is honestly kind of a dream come true. I always wanted to interview Solid Snake. So no. this was amazing. <laughs> well, I'm afraid the reality is no match for the legend. <laughs> um thank you so much uh mike uh, those are really good questions and i think you should post with the interview that that perspective on big boss versus solid snake has never been discussed before and so this was a, a groundbreaking interview well well done thank you for having me oh thank you and then i'm going to correct myself real quick the uh it is august 10th through the 13th fan expo there we go. uh all right anyways thank you guys so much for watching no thank you uh thanks so much mike